right. um, I thank the organizers for the kind introduction and folks who voted for this talk. Um, so just now we heard about serverless and now we're sort of going to jump backwards in time and all the way back to the beginning of computing and perhaps see there's some relevance for us um, even today, like many years afterwards. Um, so I think many of you probably heard of the, the story of Newton and the apple. Is that something like a familiar story? How Newton discovered uh, the concept of gravity. Hopefully after today, after this talk, you can go back and tell your friends about another story, uh, but this is not about the origins of software or computing. It's called Turing and the typewriter. Okay, so you can see, um, you can get the slides and the, the code demo from this um, URL afterwards. Okay, let's start. Um, Turing actually, when he was young, had a deep fascination with typewriters. His, his mother, uh, Sarah Turing, owns a typewriter. And in 1923, when Turing was 11 years old, he wrote a letter. I'm not sure you can see, the, the letter is on the right. He wrote a letter to his parents. He was uh, in a boarding school. His parents were in India. So he said, uh, the, the part in the red box, This week I thought of how I might invent a typewriter like this. And there's this squiggle, I'm not sure how you read the squiggle. But anyway, anyway but below he says about how he, he was, he's going to invent a typewriter. Uh, and on the left is a picture of Turing in 1926, when this was when he was 14 years old. The letter was written when he was 11. But we'll come back to the typewriter and his inspiration of it. Uh, and, and this is a typewriter in case you have not seen one, because uh, nowadays we don't use these things anymore. Uh, but they, they have an interesting history and a relationship to our field, right? How many people actually have uh, seen a typewriter in, in real life? Real one. Oh, right, that's great. Okay, it's, it's a good audience. So you know what a typewriter is. Okay, so I don't have to show you too many pictures of it. Okay. Uh, in 1936, which is like what? Um, that's just 1926, 14 years old, about 24 years old, right? 10 years afterwards. Turing wrote an extremely influential paper uh, with this very foreboding title. I'll hopefully tell you what one of the things he did in the paper. Um, so he was trying to solve, so this is the story anyway. So he was trying to solve this problem in mathematics. Um, but to solve this problem, he needed two, two components. First, he needed to define what it means by computation. And second, he needed to find something which computers could not do. Right? So he needed to do two parts. And along the way, he would invent um, the concept of software. And we'll see where that comes in. So let me go through in, in, in order. So the first part was to define what it means by computation, and that's what most of us do, right? But you, 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 you may be surprised to find that before 1936, we did not know what that means, what is computation precisely, right? And in order to reason about it, we need to have a precise definition. And here's where the typewriter comes in. His definition is based on a typewriter, as you can imagine from his lifelong fascination with typewriters. This is a modern reconstruction of his machine, which was meant to be more of a thought experiment, but someone actually built a real machine uh, recently. And you can see where it's like a typewriter. So there's this pen in the middle of the picture. That's like the typewriter head, right, where you could press a key and it will punch out the letter. But this is a little bit cleverer. It's like a read-write head. So the typewriter not only can punch out symbols, it can also read the symbol at the current position. And Turing simplified, instead of a piece of paper, which is like a 2D thing, right, um, we just do with 1D. So we just have a very long tape of paper. So we can only type left to right. We can't go up and down. But, you know, it's about the same. Because whatever you could do up and down, you could also just write it very far to the left or very far to the right. Uh, so, but that's not enough because this should be automatic. So typewriter, you need someone to punch the keys. So he, he devised a kind of a, a logical tables to replace the person. So this becomes a fully automatic uh, kind of a computer, a proto computer in a sense. So let's look at his, um, in a sense, his first um, machine, I would call it. It's like the Hello World machine of uh, the day. But, but of course, Hello World wasn't popular at that time in 1936. So let me tell you about how this works. Um, uh, he calls this M config. M config is called the machine configuration. Here is all B, so we can forget about M config. Um, then there's symbol. Symbol means what I am currently observing on the tape, the current symbol. Right, that is printed on the tape. So they have like, three cases. It could be, let's say, there's nothing on the tape. The tape is blank, right? None. Then I will perform some operations. So here the operation is P0, means print the character 0 at that place. So now when it was blank, it became 0. Okay? And if, it was a, if I observe a 0, 
I will move my head to the right twice and print the character 1. If I observe the character 1, I will move the head right twice and print the character 0. So let's do a demo, which is always tricky, but let's try. So we'll, we'll run this program uh, on a little Turing machine emulator that I wrote. So you can see the little V here shows you the head of the machine, and uh, it, the little text on top is, the, is sort of the machine table. Right? It's pretty much a literal translation, except I, I, instead of none, I use the tilde representing none. So you can see what happens. So it, it sees nothing, it prints a zero. Right? Then it sees a zero, so it moves right twice, and it prints a one. Then it sees a one, it moves right twice, and prints a zero. And that uh, repeats infinitely. Right? So Turing was a mathematician, so he was interested in numbers. His, his paper was called On Computable Numbers. This is actually a number, uh, but you must append the um, 0 0.0101. So this is a number, you add 0 dot in front, it's a decimal number, 0 0.010101. But because Turing was so ahead of his time, this number is in binary. This is not a decimal number. So this is a decimal expansion of some number, which is 0 0.01010101 forever and ever. Right, so uh, I'll leave it up to you to, to think about what number this exactly is he was trying to print. Okay, so this was the sort of hollow world. Uh, let's continue the slide. So in a sense, he had this definition, this table, and then this typewriter-like thing, right, which controls the machine. And this is the logic table. Okay. And he put forth this very famous thesis, which is Turing's thesis, which is every computation can be performed by some machine of this particular design. Right? And uh, it was, there, were, there were several definitions floating around at the time in 1936, and uh, Turing's one was accepted as the best definition, although all of them were equivalent in some way. Um, but uh, this quote from Gödel, the, the preeminent logician of the time, um, he felt that Turing's one was best captures what it means by computation. Okay. Now, okay, let's come to part two of the problem. Remember, part one was to de define what computation means, and Turing did so in terms of this particular um, typewriter-like machine model with this uh, logical table right, as, a, as a control mechanism. So now we need to find something that uh, this kind of machines cannot solve. Right? That seems like a very tough problem. Actually, this, this is a really hard part. And in the, in the paper, if you read, he shows the machines can do many things, not just print 0101. He, he gave many other examples, which I don't have time to go through. Um, so the, the real insight here was to say, well, the machines are quite powerful. They can do a lot of things. So let's try to make a machine which can tell us about another machine. So to, to, it's like reflection. Can we make one machine as the input to another machine and have it tell us something about its behavior? For example, if I give you a machine, give, give machine A to machine B, can machine B tell me if A would ever print the character zero? Right? And since machines are quite powerful, we can do a lot of things, maybe this would be something machine B cannot do. It can never tell me if machine A would ever print the symbol zero. It's like sort of twisting the power of the machine against itself, right? By feeding one machine as input to the, another machine. Um, so in, in doing so, when you have uh, one of the machine as the input, you need a particular primitive, which he uh, established, which is here comes the, the punchline of the, the talk. Um, in order to deal with machines as input, right? so machine B, remember, takes machine A as input right? and try to answer something about what machine A can or cannot do, he needs a way to sort of simulate machine A in, within machine B itself. So let me just uh, say this. He, he found that it's possible to construct a certain machine that can sort of pretend to be every other machine. So the second part of the, he calls this machine U, right? And U, uh, on the tape of U is written the SD. SD is the term in his paper. It's called the standard um, description. It's written the description of another machine M and then you would compute the same thing as M, right? So if you squint very hard, you can actually see this sentence sets out what we call software. Because software is something we put on some kind of medium, 
in this case was tape, but it could be your SD card, could be your thumb drive, could be from the network or whatever. And your computer is actually pretending to be this other thing which this software tells it how to perform, right? It's just like if maybe have you seen ATM machines? ATM machines actually are not custom built, if you knew. They're actually running like Windows um, inside. But they run an ATM software. So to you, they look like just a custom built ATM machine. But they could do a lot more things, but you know. Obviously, they make, make it like a kiosk. You can't do any other things with it. So, so what is software in Turing's terms? He said, actually, software, we can think of it in another way, is a description of some machine, M, some, some description of a machine. And his sentence, you could sort of write it mathematically like this. If you think of machines as a function, a mathematical function, so this machine U, when executed on a description of M, is equivalent to running M directly. Does that make sense? So notice here we say the description of M, because M is actually a table. Or, I mean, all machines are basically tables. This table is like, later, just now we saw a three-line table, right? So a table, you can't really put on the tape, because a table is this logical thing. So at the same time, Turing had to invent a compiler, because he had to compile from a table to a string a string of symbols, which is a linear thing, so that he could put it on the tape. Does that make sense? There's a, one additional step here, which is to compile from this table into a, a string, and this string uh, is then placed on the tape of U. So the string containing the description of M is put on the tape for U, and U can run it and behave like M. Okay, now we come to the, the big demo. Hopefully we'll try to see this. So I'll show you another kind of machine, uh, which is not the Hello World machine. It's called the Zero One machine. So, oh, sorry, I'll just clear this. Uh, the Zero One machine is also very simple. The Zero One machine just tells you if the input on the tape, so the part after the blank is the tape. The part before the blank is the table. All right, so if you see here, there's a, some three lines, which is the table. Then there's a blank. The Zero One Zero One is the stuff on the tape. So I'm representing two different parts in the same file. So let's run this and see what it does, right? Um, so if you run this, this very simple machine, I won't go through the details, would check if the tape contains the infinite sequence 0101, uh, or, or some, some sequence, some finite prefix of 0101. If it contains some uh, repetition of 0101, it would print a one at the back of it and terminate. It means this is good, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something 01, one or more times, right? And uh, I can show you another example where you don't have 0101. Oh, sorry, I have to show you the program first. Uh, well, show you the... So this is an example where the, in, the, the, program, the, the machine table is the same, but the input is changed. Now the input is 01011, right? So it's not what it's looking for. So if you run this, it will, it will sort of just die halfway because it's like, ah, this is not what I'm expecting. Because after a one, I always expect a zero because it's 0101, right? So if it's not what it's looking for, it will just sort of crash and die, okay? Now, we'll follow through Turing's uh, thing and we're gonna compile this table onto the tape. And I'll show you what it looks like now on the tape. Uh, tape. Okay, so on top, you see the same thing, which is the, the three lines of the table and the one line of the tape. Below that is actually a different file called 01.tape after the comments which starts with this ccc111 r1c blah 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 and ccc210101 right the bottom three lines is the first line the ccc and so on is the compiled um, program it's the three lines of the machine table compiled into a giant string i won't tell you how that is done but that's a little bit complicated but let's pretend that it is and then there's the ccc which separates the which separates the actual description of the machine from the input to the machine. The input to the machine is 210101, um, which is like the first one, except the zero replaced with a two. It's like that because I, we needed to tell the machine where its head is at the beginning. So the, the head of machine M is in, on top of the character zero. That's why it's not written as zero, it's written as two, right? So um, we need to run this on what Turing calls the universal machine this U, U, if you recall, and he actually constructs U in his paper, but we'll use a more modernized version of U. U looks something like this. It looks quite horrible, I know, but it's not very long, you would suspect. It's only 181 lines. 
U is this machine that can pretend to be every other machine, right? That's basically our like computers, because they can pretend to be any other things, right? Based on input. So let's uh, run this now. Oh, sorry, we will run utm.tm on 01.tape. So we supplied the tape, which is the tape now is this giant, um, this, this whole thing is the tape, right? Which is the CCC and so on, which is, contains the description of M, some separator, and then the input to M. We run it on top of the universal machine, the machine U, zero on the tape. Uh, okay, I think I, then we need to run it a bit faster because this thing is a little slow, as you can imagine. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so here you can see the tape is a lot more complicated because now the tape contains the description of M, which is this original zero one machine that detects whether an uh, input is zero or one. Uh, uh, input is a repetition of zero one zero one. So the first part of the tape is the description of M. The behind part of the tape is the input to M, and this entire thing is the input to the universal machine U. Right? So the first part is like your software. The behind part is like your data for your software. And U is like your x86 or your um, ARM processor. So uh, let me give you some intuition on how it works. So as you can see, originally there was a number two, right? and the two sometimes become a three and so on. Actually, this shows the head moving around. Because the, the machine M has its own machine head. right? It needs to know where it is in the data. right? So we use uh, alternate characters to represent the location of machine M's head. And you can see the actual machine U has to go back and forth because it must go back to the machine M and see, OK, what is M going to do? Then I'm going to do the same thing on the encoded bit of data. So here, actually, you see it entered state 40, which means it's successfully completed because this, the input actually is 0101. OK. So that is the, the main thing. So I'm actually kind of more or less done. Okay. Uh, okay I see I have a bit of time. Okay. Um, so it turns out that you know, this realization um, was not well understood even 20 years after Turing's paper came out. So Howard Eichen, if you don't know, is, is the inventor of the Mark I, and he's also the boss of um, Grace Hopper, who helped him build the Mark I. And he, he said this, and I think in a congressional testimony. So he was very surprised. You know, if you could have one machine that could both solve differential equations and calculate how much uh, money a particular department store makes or whatever, right? And today, of course, we just use the same machine for both tasks without blinking an eye. But in, even in the 50s, this was not well understood. Um, but afterwards, I think Turing became more well known because um, his work was brought out to the, the West, I mean, in, in, to the States. And then you know, the Turing Awards and the ACM uh, had to recognize Turing's um, early work in computing. Okay. So let me finish off. I think I'm sort of in a good place. Um, so, that, so that's mostly from the paper. And you would think, oh, well, Turing was a mathematician and he was a theoretician, and this is about it. Um, but it turns out, no, there's more things he did. Because after the paper, which is 1936, he went into uh, the British government working for the uh, crypto uh, lab to break the naval encryption. This is the famous uh, story told in the movie The Imitation Game. Uh, worth watching, actually, but a, a bit of over-dramatization there. Uh, <laughs> but after the war, um, Brit, uh, Turing went to the National Physical Laboratories, uh, also in the UK, and they asked him to design an actual computer, a real physical Turing machine of a sort. So, and he, he in fact did. He produced a report on the ACE. You can, you can look it up online now. I think all these things are now online. You can look it up. The ACE is called the Automatic Computing Engine. It was, it was designed by Turing. He wrote actually a very detailed design, much more detailed than von Neumann's uh, famous ADSEC report. Um, including all the parts, logical diagrams, how much money it would take to build one, although he, he vastly under, uh, underestimated the cost, as in all software projects or hardware projects. Uh, so it was proposed by Turing in 1946, just merely 10 years after his um, groundbreaking work and a couple of years after the war. Unfortunately, he could not get the budget to build it because you know, after the war, all, the, all your wartime uh, contributions were uh, classified. You could not say. Uh, how you knew how to build all these things, because he was involved in building the bomb and, and some of the other machines during the war, he knew how to design machines. Uh, but he could not really say why he knew these things, because this was part of classified things he did uh, as part of war efforts. So unfortunately, uh, he left NPL 
a couple of years afterwards, but it was eventually built because his design was just so good that they thought, okay, you know, Turing's not around, but let, let's try and build this thing. So they built a simplified version of it called the Pilot Ace, and the Pilot Ace was built in 1950. Um, and for the time, it was the fastest computer of its time. It was running at a, 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 a supremely fast one megahertz in 1950. It was the fastest machine of that time, right? So Turing's design panned out in the end, although it cost a lot more money to build than he thought, but you know, it happens. Okay, so let me just summarize uh, the session. Hopefully you remember about Turing and the typewriter. That's the, the key message. And, and in Turing's term, software really is a description of some machine. And it's still a valid thinking in some time. Think of, think of like kiosk, right? If in a kiosk, the, the, mach the whole machine behaves like just one thing, like an ATM. Even though behind it is really a general purpose uh, computer, right? And uh, oh, it's the old uh, link. But anyway, the, the tiny CC URL is better. And um, if, if you prefer to look at the books, there are some really interesting um, books you should check out. The Annotated Turing, which is the paper, really, uh, but with some annotations of what it means in today's terms. And the uh, Universal Computer traces the story all the way back before Turing's time, all the way back to Leibniz, uh, which is a longer story, which I'm not going to touch. OK, so that's, that's all I have for you today. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, if there are any? Yes? the person who popularized uh, Turing's work in, in, in the West, and, I mean in the US. And what we call the von Neumann architecture really is the Turing architecture, right? You just saw that there was the idea of putting the software and the data on the tape together, right? It's a combined uh, system like that. It's the stored program computer as we call it today. And Turing, I mean von Neumann definitely read Turing's paper and based his design on it actually. Um, yeah, so really, when you say von Neumann architecture, we should say you know, Turing's architecture. Yeah. But von Neumann did popularize um, Turing's um, achievements, so that's why he got more well known in, in, in the West, in the, in the States after that. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, I guess. That's, that's the end then, thank you, and thank you for your time.